Thank you all for joining another conversation with the Marguerite Casey Foundation Book Club, Reading for a Liberated Future. My name is Dr. Carmen Rojas, and I'm the president and CEO of Marguerite Casey Foundation. Today, I'll be in conversation with author Olufemi Taiwo and Maurice Mitchell. Femi is an associate professor of philosophy at Georgetown University and the author of Elite Capture, How the Powerful Took Over Identity Politics and Everything Else. Maurice is a nationally recognized social movement strategist, a visionary leader in the movement for Black Lives, and the national director of Working Families Party. Before we get started, I'd love to thank our wonderful co-sponsors, Seattle Arts and Lectures. Seattle Arts and Lectures engages and inspires readers and writers of all generations in the greater Puget Sound region. I also want to share a little bit about the Marguerite Casey Foundation. Marguerite Casey Foundation supports leaders, scholars, and initiatives focused on shifting the balance of power in society, building power for communities that continue to be excluded from shaping how society works and from sharing in its rewards and freedoms. This includes purchasing and sharing works from authors like Femi with our beloved community. Marguerite Casey Foundation is committed to providing over a thousand free copies through the book club to a mix of our registered guests and community-based organizations. We're thrilled that those watching today can access its important messages. Thank you so much, Maurice and Femi, for joining us today. Thank you, it's good to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, Femi, I'm gonna start with you. So let's just start at the beginning. Uh, can you help us understand what elite capture means and draw on some current and re or recent examples of how you see this system at work? So the basic thing that I'm describing with um, elite capture, you could think of as a, just another version of inequality. So often when we talk about inequality, we mean inequality in terms of stuff. For example, wealth inequality. So we could measure the amount of wealth that, say, the top 1% have, and we could compare that with the amount of wealth that everyone else has, and we could get one measure of economic inequality in society that way. And a society where the top 1% owns 10% of the wealth or, or land or whatever um, um, we're thinking about, whatever resource we're thinking about, would be less unequal than a society where the top 1% owns half of the wealth in a society. That same insight that we use to think about inequality writ large, we could um, use to think about not just the inequality of stuff, but actually the inequality of action. How easy is it for you to do things in the world, which has to do with how much wealth you have, but also has to do with other kinds of things, connection, how much attention you command, so on and so forth. Um, so in general, elite captures this practical kind of inequality. It's what happens when not only resources like wealth, but also resources like attention, and most importantly, our political agendas themselves end up under the control and of the most advantaged members of society. Can you give us like a, a, a real world example? How is this manifesting today in our day-to-day -day lives? So there's a few real world examples. Um, one example that I'll use just because um, this is, because it's tied to um, people that we're gonna go on to talk about today. Um, Barbara Smith, one of the original members of the Columbia River Collective, um, who came up with the term identity politics, which I'm sure we'll talk about later. Um, she wrote an article talking about why she um, had some disagreements politically with the larger LGBTQ movement. Um, and that is because over time, um, what had been a movement for broad gender and sexual liberation ended up focusing on particular issues, um, in particular uh, marriage equality. And there was um, the suggestion that that's not necessarily representative of, you know, what a movement that was responding to everybody under mm -hmm. that umbrella or equally to everyone under that umbrella would prioritize. Um, that issue represents, we could say, you know, the capture of that movement in the zone of electoral politics by particularly well positioned people. In this case, um, maybe. Um, 
white male gay people um, who preferred that issue to other issues that could have been prioritized. Mm. That's super helpful. Maurice, before we start bringing you into the conversation about elite capture and how you're seeing this framing at play um, in your work, can you share a little bit about Working Families Party? And it'd be great just to hear your vision for what the future will look like because of the work that you're leading. Sure. So the Working Families Party is a, is a national grassroots political movement that seeks to ensure that our politics are for the many and not the few. Um, we uh, have activists in every state um, and we have a serious operation building on the ground with staff and other capacity in 20 states. And what we do is we recruit activists and individuals to get involved in their elections, give them the tools for, for them to be to get involved in elections. We also uh, do a lot of pipeline work. What I mean by that is we support people and their leadership development and their political education so that they could hone their skills and actually run for office. Uh, and we believe that working people and the interests of working people, the diversity of working people should be represented at all levels of government. And it's very, very challenging to do so for a number of reasons, um, many of which I think Femi gets gets into in the book. And so we look for opportunities to hack the system and, and ways to create space so that working people um, with their networks of uh, other working people and um, issues that could command and build strong coalitions could come together and win against entrenched politicians that have the backing of organized capital and have the backing of sort of the, the traditional sort of political networks. And in our history, we've been very successful getting uh, candidates who otherwise wouldn't be on the ballot, otherwise would not be able to win a successful primary against a, an incumbent elected. And then um, they've done a lot of work to govern in ways that have reflected the interest of working people. And we try to do that um, on all levels, but the local level to us is our bread and butter in municipal races and state state Senate and uh, other legislatures. That's where we could actually build a very broad pipeline around the, the country of labor organizers or educators or activists uh, that could run, that could learn how to govern and co-govern uh, with with other uh, activists, other um, working people, other organizations like labor institutions or grassroots organizations. And then later on, be able to build that into challenging at the federal level. So we have examples like Greg Kazar in the Austin area or Summer Lee in the Pittsburgh area, young independent progressives that have built pretty broad coalitions uh, that have been able to defeat a lot of money from the right wing and from interests like APAC and from uh, pharmaceutical companies and other uh, interests that, that don't wanna see politics that are, are more democratic. Mm. Thank you so much, Maurice. Before I come back to you, Femi, I actually, um, one of the things that I loved about the book is the ways in which uh, elite capture uh, sort of blends into our day-to-day -day life experience. And I'm wondering through your research, what are the things that you think are important for us to hold in order or to understand in order to shine a light on elite capture? Like, um, uh, what are the lighthouses that we need in our country right now in order to make this practice more visible? I think one of the things that was definitely more most illuminating for me um, actually came up in what Maurice was just talking about. So Working Families Pipe Party um, is building pipelines, right, to basically route resources and political opportunities to people who otherwise wouldn't have them. And part of what's important about them doing that is the fact that the broader social system that we're working to change is so hard at work all the time, pipelining opportunities elsewhere to people who already have advantages and pipelining problems to the people who already have the most disadvantages. Um, so one of the things that I, one of the ways that I put it in the book is I 
say that some kids are pipelined to PhDs and other are pipelined to prisons. One of the central challenges that the book is trying to put forward is this idea of pipelines, this idea that where things end up is built into our social system in the way that pipelines are built into the plumbing. And that's the kind of lighthouse that we should shine on our individual interactions. Why is it that I'm even in a position to talk to this person? Um, it has to do with where advantages have been pipelined to and where disadvantages have been pipelined to. And so maybe appreciating that means that I shouldn't be so quick to trust which views I have access to, which ideas, which people, which perspectives have been pipelined into my social space. You know, maybe I should be willing to take a second look at that and think, you know, what am I missing? Which perspectives have I not heard from? Um, you know, what isn't in this room because of how our society is built? Maurice, how are you seeing elite capture um, and frankly, the whole range of concepts, including pipelines um, and pipelining uh, in your day to day work at Working Families Party and sort of more broadly, like take a step back. We gave you a book and we're like, here's a book. What do you <laughs> what do you think and how does it resonate given what you're trying to do? Wow. Well, yeah, I, I think the, the book I'm. I, I can't be more enthusiastic about this book being published. And in fact, me and other organizers have been doing a lot of thinking and writing around some of these ideas because we're in the field um, and we're and we are wrestling with these contradictions every day. So I could give two examples, one from my time, you know, early in the movement for Black Lives. So I remember in 2014, um, when the uprising in Ferguson really lit a fire and exposed a lot of people, specifically white people, uh, to the contradictions and the challenges and the realities of anti-Black racism and police violence in this country. And there was a dialogue, a national dialogue. The president was opining about it. Now, what I saw was a social movement had surfaced a contradiction, had posed a question. But the people who were able to answer, the people who had the capacity to answer, and also the and also the people who understood the rules of the game, to use a, a metaphor or frame that, that Femi used in the book, were people in organized capital. So Taser International uh, was able to offer body cameras as a solution to, to violence against Black people. Fast forward to today, you know, most police departments have body cameras. Body cameras is the is the mark is the neoliberal market solution to police violence against black people what we've experienced is that the proliferation of body cameras has not um seen with it a market decline in police violence but it's certainly been, been an opportunity for this multinational corporation to profit right mm -hmm. and so to me that's an example of an opportunity or opening that that mass movements from the ground up Black mass movements were able to, to sort of produce, um, but ultimately because we we live under neo neoliberal capitalism, that crisis was taken advantage of by the folks who have the most capacity. And and the the other example I would I would use is the work I do every single day, and it goes back to the rules of the game. So we're operating based on the current electoral rules. The current electoral rules of the first past the post um, winner takes all two party electoral system are designed specifically so that non elites can't participate. Mm -hmm. Right. Th that's why they're designed that way. Right. So every single day I wake up every day playing a game that is so tilted against what I'm trying to do um, that it requires a lot of thinking, a lot of capacity, a lot of strategy to figure out where the gaps are. The last thing I'll say is, is that, you know, if if Femi's book was just a, like, uh, elite capture is so deterministic, then why do we organize in the first place, right? Great question, <laughs> right? yes. And the, the, the thing I would say is that despite all of that, um, 
you know, elites are not gods. And even though they've, they've developed these games, uh, the, and the, even though they've rigged it, there are all types of hacks that, that could happen. There's all types of um, openings that could be taken advantage of. And a lot of our work is looking for the openings and looking for the weaknesses in these games and in these systems and taking advantage of them. And the thing that I'm struggling with is like, you know, um, towards the end, where Femi talks about like, despite all of this, we still have the ability to do stuff, right? We still have the ability to to not to walk on the on the sidewalk if we want to. So then for us as organizers, right? What does not walking on the sidewalk look like for us? For me, as somebody who is in, engaged in electoral politics in the context of the United States, what does not walking on the sidewalk look like for me? I think every single organizer when we're sitting down, we're developing strategy. We need to ask ourselves those questions. How are we not unknowingly replicating the system? How are we forming a challenge to the system? How are we not walking on the sidewalk? How are we building anew? The last thing I'll say is, you know, uh, folks in Mi Gente have a framework that they take from comrades in South America that they're trying to work both against the state within the state and outside of the state. And I really like that framework because, you know, back to Femi's book, the outside of the state stuff is us building our own house and building our own rooms. And I think the against the state stuff is mitigating the harm that's taking place, you know, and inside the state, I think is doing a lot of the work that that I do, which is like inside of a system that we know is stacked against us, finding the hacks, finding the different uh, contradictions that could be challenged in order to advance our side. Yeah, I love that you brought up the work in Chile. Like I have found it so helpful to uh, have proximity to to be a member of Mi Gente and to really dig deep into an approach to shifting power that is so multidimensional. Maurice, what does it look like for you to not walk on the sidewalk? Sure. So what it looks like to me is, number one, identifying people like Kendra Brooks in Philadelphia. Kendra Brooks is an organizer who is a working class um, activist who's experienced a lot of the harms of the economy um, from the multiple economic crises, who through those harms got involved and who should not be sitting in any city council based on the traditional rules of the game. What Kendra did was she built a coalition through Working Families Party that included a broad array of folks. Um, it was a truly multi, and it is a truly multiracial coalition that includes working class black folks, it includes white progressives, it includes uh, Latinx uh, organizers and activists, it includes labor institutions. Um, and so Kendra to me, and back to the pipeline, Kendra to me and her successful run to be an at-large city council person, not as a Democrat, but as a working families party person, um, has, has not is historically something that should not happen because of the rigid two-party system. We were able to build a coalition to make that happen and then create a possibility model so that more of that could happen. Mm. Um, and Kendra is not just one sole magical person. She built a movement around her that is co-governing with her, right? So the more Kendra Brooks, which is in, on so many levels outside of what should ever happen in our rigid two-party system, uh, to me, the more opportunities for us to use governing power in really transformative ways. Mm. Fabi, I want to ask you the same question, and I want to ask you the same question, but with a bit of a, a spin, right? So... As you know, we have a uh, an initiative at Margaret Casey Foundation called Freedom Scholars, mostly because I believe the academy is a terrain in which uh, there are always rooms to rename the sidewalk, right? Like the sidewalk is very fixed in academia, and there are a set of ideas, including neoliberalism, that were born in these institutions that we sort of take for granted as the oxygen that we breathe. And I think it's a part of my responsibility in this role, our job at Marguerite Casey Foundation to seed into the world a different set of ideas. And so I'm wondering, as an academic, what does it look like for you uh, to not walk on the sidewalk? 
That's a good question. Um, one of the things that's different about academia than other jobs and that makes it, um, that gives it a different set of possibilities from at least some other jobs is just the extent to which it's self-directed, right? We, so much of how the academy polices itself is through norms, right? So if, you know, just to keep with this sidewalk metaphor, right? It's as if you have one part of the city where, you know, there are cops around and they write jaywalking tickets all the time. And another part of the city where people just frown at you if you, you know, don't use the sidewalk the way that you're supposed to. Um, and, you know, as you can tell, it's not really all that metaphorical. There are parts of cities where people are likely to get jaywalking tickets, right? Um, but jumping out of the metaphor for a second, the point is, you know, you have a lot of autonomy over what it is that you study and how that you study it. And I think part of using that autonomy is actually maybe less about what you study and more about who you study with. So walking off the sidewalk for me has been rebalancing the academic stuff that I do towards doing it with a larger group of people, which some people will frown at you for, um, but nobody is writing me tickets for, mm -hmm. you know, writing in public outlets or, you know, having conversations like this with you and Maurice um, and making that kind of central to how it is that I do academic work and which questions I take up and, you know, who I'm in conversation with. So I think that's the first thing I would say. Great. I Both of you are um, have a, a very real interest and commitment to replacing neoliberal racial capitalism as the dominant uh, world and economic order. I have a, like a couple of questions. One, I think a question that I consistently get asked is what takes it, its place? And then second, related to the book, um, what are the key questions that we can be asking ourselves, both philosophically and tactically, as we dream for this greater future? I want to like tie this back to something you both have either said or intimated, um, such that we're not replicating sort of the features of elite capture, right? Um, so the having... <laughs> I don't know why this comes comes to my mind, but like having VCs wear Patagonia the jackets, right? Like we don't want that same thing to be replicated in this new system. So what replicates, what replaces, sorry, um, the current order? And then what are the questions that you all think that we should be asking ourselves? Femi, I'm going to start with you. Yeah. So... What replaces the current order? Um, so I'm going to give my answer, and then I'm going to give a value that maybe can help us frame what other answers might be. But, you know, I'm an eco-socialist. So, you know, most of what I'm going to say is let people own stuff and let people decide directly what to do with the stuff, right? Show me some stuff. And I'll show you some stuff I want to be publicly owned for the most part, you know. Um, so, you know, broadly speaking, public ownership, participatory forms of decision making, whether it's participatory budgeting or whether it's direct democratic forms of decision making, you know, picking legislators by lottery. There's a lot of things people are talking about and have actually tried in the real world. And there's, you know, real answers to the question of how we could all govern together in a democratic way. Um, but the value that goes behind that and that I think should go behind any answer for, you know, what it is that we should replace neoliberal racial capitalism with is self-determination. And lots of people over centuries have talked about the political value of self-determination. It was a key part of anti-colonial struggles. You know, even liberal internationalists have talked about the idea of self-determination. But 
you know, one way to think about it is determining things yourself. And that is a, I think, fruitful expression of what the democratic ideal, if it's going to be a real commitment to substantive political structures rather than a kind of aesthetic commitment to, you know, the cosmetic appeal of having votes every four years, right? If it's going to be a real commitment to something substantial, this is one way of saying what that commitment might be. You know, whatever kind of political system we choose, I think we should be able to say of that system that it allows the people in it to self-determine. That gives them a meaningful, direct say in the circumstances of their lives, along with you know the lives of the other people that they live with and around. So you know any system that can deliver on that is one worth considering. But I, of course, have my team. Maurice. Yeah, I I would um, I would associate myself with just about everything that me just said, and um, I think the thing that the, the way that I look at it is that um, it's less of a destination and more of a process that I'm interested in, mm. right? Um, and I'm very much interested in in radically democratic processes, so that working people could be the protagonist who will determine the systems that they, they seek to be in, right? And so um, that requires a democratic society that includes a democratic economy, right? And I think one of the things that, one of the things that we find so vexing is that we're trying to set up these democratic sort of systems to manage our society, but at the same time, we've created this economic system that is wholly undemocratic, that will eventually capture the other parts of the society, right? Yeah. Um, and we might be able to, like Femi was saying, we might be able to vote every four years, but not actually experience any meaningful democracy. So I think it's critical that we 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 shift to a system that is truly democratic, where, 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 where people have a say in the decisions that impact their lives, a meaningful say in the decisions that impact their lives, which I think most people would agree is generally not the case. Um, and perhaps we could tolerate that if the outcomes were good, but the outcomes are, right. are wholly unacceptable and wholly um, not satisfying to most people on the planet. <laughs> so so I, I think either way, we have to move to a different system. And I I think a different system will come I don't necessarily think that system will, in fact, be more democratic unless we organize in that mm -hmm. direction. I do think there's an opportunity for a different, less democratic system to replace this one, right? Um, but you know, which is which is why I'm invested in organizing to move in the other direction. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm going to stay on this point. I mean, I think that uh, one of the themes for me that the scary part of this book, that's what I'm going to say, uh, is frankly, like everything having to do with misinformation and propaganda and frankly, like the accessibility and the uh, quickness with which uh, propaganda and misinformation are being tied to repression, both political rep repression and physical repression. I'm like wondering from a working families party perspective, like how are you navigating this and what are you seeing are uh, some antidotes? Well, I, I think what we're seeing, right? I, I, I don't think we could talk about the repression or the lack of democracy uh, that we're experiencing in the United States and we're experiencing elsewhere and the rise of the far right without talking about capitalism and neoliberalism, right? I think what's happening is that most people on the planet are feeling some sense of social dislocation, um, some, some real sense of economic insecurity and physical insecurity that is not um, artificial, they're not making it up. It's a very material feeling of a lack of safety, both economic safety and physical safety. And the right, the right wing um, and the far right and ethno-nationalists have produced a critique of neoliberalism 
and have also articulated what their solution is. And their solution is um, authoritarianism. Um, and th they're arguing that they could improve the physical and economic security of the masses of people um, if people give up on liberal democracy. And on the other side, there's um, there's a, a bunch of folks, but mainly the center right and center left and neoliberals who are arguing passionately for, for liberal democracy, but with no solution to people's physical and, mm -hmm. e and economic insecurity. And as a result, there's a lot of everyday people who are moving towards and aligning themselves with authoritarian, authoritarians and against democracy in this particular political moment. And I think, um, and authoritarianism comes with it, more, more political violence and more repression and everything else and um, a heightened sort of police state and a heightened militarism. And so we're seeing all of that because we need a, we, the answer to me is a strong left that could offer a sharp critique of neoliberalism that also delivers a clear and meaningful material solutions to working people. Um, and until we're able to organize that, uh, we're gonna be in a position where there's going to be more repression, more political violence, and a, a heightened ability for the ultra-right and neo-fascists to take governing power. Mm -hmm. Um. I want to actually stay with you, Maurice. What is step one? So, like, what is the step one that is from? I may actually ask both of you guys this question. This is like a, a repeat or a different way of asking that last question. The the thing that I loved about this book is that I felt like it was the perfect assessment of something that was vexing me. Uh, the challenge for me was, uh, what is what is my step one? And so I wonder what, how you all are sitting with that question. Like, what is your step one? And I'll start with you, Maurice, and then I'll go to you, Femi. Yeah, but I was hopeful at the end of Femi's book because I feel like one of the solution is organizing, right? Like, I, I think it's hard for individuals to choose to walk off, off of the sidewalk or to do it in any meaningful way. But when we collectively organize, we can take big leaps together mm -hmm. and do audacious things that we shouldn't do together. Mm -hmm. And I think the best organizing does that, both both in movement moments when it happens in a way that is like cataclysmic, and also the more structured organizing that we've seen in labor unions, where it's everyday workers building the confidence to do something that they're not supposed to do based on all of the rules and doing it anyway. Mm -hmm. And I just, I think the more we're able to invest in organizing, like real organizing um, and, and build larger and larger organizing institutions where more and more working people can get together and take those risks together, I think the more we were able to interrupt the appeal of the very like seductive appeal of authoritarians and and also interrupt a lot of the misinformation that's leading so many working people to align with corporate interests or the interests of, of authoritarians. Hmm. Yeah, I totally agree with that last point. Um, and I think part of the reason for, you know, agreeing with that point comes from the conversation both of you were having just a second earlier about misinformation. I think it's definitely true that, you know, the right pretends to have answers about security, right, uh, about material security, um, even kind of cultural security. Maybe some of this attack on critical race theory has to do with, you know, cementing how people feel their place in the world is like. Um, so they definitely pretend to have those answers about security, but also neoliberalism structurally takes away the answers right if you don't if you no longer have long-term intergenerational housing security people have to leave people don't know they can live together if you don't have strong social ties because people you know feel they're at war with each other you don't have a culture of social support because you've stigmatized the welfare system those erode the kinds of relationships of trust 
that are actually the basis for well-functioning information structures, right? If, if, if the information is out there, but you don't believe it, right, it, it almost doesn't matter. That's kind of what we've seen in the COVID-19 response, where people's trust networks, to a large extent, kind of dictated whether or not they responded to the information that was provided by the CDC and other, you know, scientists. And so the answer becomes organizing, not just because of what Marie said, which is you get to do things that aren't written into the rules of the system and showing people that they have that capacity means that they could take it even further than one organizing win or two organizing wins or 10. Um, but also you get those wins together. You're doing something together. And we've seen historically through social science about political attitudes in unions, we've seen that linking people's political behavior to each other, to defending each other, to advancing their interests with each other, changes how people view each other, lowers um, racial bigotry among people who are in unions, it lowers uh, gendered attitudes, it increases people's willingness to support all kinds of other people. And that builds the kind of trust that is necessary for healthier information. Um, it builds the kind of trust that's necessary for direct democratic co-decision making. And it builds the kind of trust that's necessary for bigger organizing tomorrow than we did today. Mm -hmm. And that's what it's going to take. Mm -hmm. um, I, you know, what I, one of the many things I keep, I, uh, one of the many things that I love about this short book is that I feel like there are a million ways that you come at the issue, right? So like from gaming theory to actual organizing, and then, um, I love the introduction of the history of Guinea-Bissau and Kate Verde. Uh, and I am really curious what you think we could learn from movements. Uh, and why? Why did you choose these two places? And why did you choose Amilcar Cabral as like a, a protagonist uh, and freedom fighter, frankly, in this story? Yeah, I thought a lot about which example to use in uh, telling the story. Um, and part of choosing Cape Verde and Guinea-Bissau is just the fact that I'm an Emilcar Cabral stan, as you can all see, right? Um, I, he's just somebody whose political thoughts and judgment and actual history of activism you know, really strike me as being deeply principled and deeply intelligent and deeply morally exemplary. Mm -hmm. um, so part of it is just the deep admiration I have for this liberation struggle. But I think even more so was the actual sort of network dynamics of how this liberation struggle worked. It was deeply international at every stage in terms of where some of the initial plotters of the of what became the African Party for the Independence of Guinea Bissau and Cape Verde um, met. Uh, they met in you know in the Imperial Core in Lisbon in the so-called Global North in Portugal, which is a NATO member and which was a NATO member state at that time. Um, they met doing anti-fascist work in Portugal. Um, these were people from all across the African continent, Angola, Mozambique, Cape Verde, um, Guinea-Bissau, and they decided to go back home and fight. And they got help from yet even more places. Cuba sent troops, which no one else did. Um, you know, they, they kind of stand first and foremost um, as far as non-African powers go in the African liberation struggle, um, but the broader organization of African unity all sent aid of some kind, um, especially Sekuture in Guinea-Conakry, which is just next door, um, uh, Czechoslovakia, Bulgaria, Sweden, all these places sent support, and they didn't do so for reasons that are easily articulable in terms of, you know, um, kind of real politic 
right? It's not as though um, there are secret plutonium stores in Guinea-Bissau that all these people were going to get. You know, this came from, of course, the international competition of the Cold War, but also from a deep sense of solidarity. Um, and those are things that can go together. And I think one of the lessons I wanted people to draw from this example is what can be accomplished with solidarity mm -hmm. and a particular way that we can get a lot of solidarity and walk off of the political sidewalk is to be internationalist about thinking about the, pol the ideas of solidarity, where we can get support and who we can get support from. Mm -hmm. I, yeah, I, uh, I love that you said it so succinctly, like for me, the antidote to elite capture is solidarity. And uh, I am always trying to figure out from this job and this moment how to like reintroduce, rearticulate solidarity and freedom, frankly, as an end uh, that we should all be working towards because I, I worry that we've shied away from like an audacious and powerful word and have made up a whole host of other words uh, instead of saying what we mean. Um, I have one final question for both of you. Um, you are both sort of in a moment in places where you are uh, leading, thinking, leading, organizing, leading work. Uh, and I wonder like, what are the questions that you ask yourself uh, so that you can check whether or not you are complicit in the project of elite capture? How do like, uh, what are the flags or things that you try to um, check? Uh, and I'm gonna start with you, Maurice, and then I'm gonna close with you, Femi. Well, you know, it, that's actually a really profound question that I think with all humility, it's not easy to answer because, you know, like like Femi, um, I think articulated really beautifully in, in the book, elite capture is a system. It's not good or bad people, you know, or, you know, um, really disciplined, organized people versus folks who aren't disciplined and organized. Mm -hmm. Like, I think you could be a wonderful person, very disciplined, um, very um, principled, and participate in, in elite capture because of the nature of the system we live under. Uh, so given all that, um, I do think, I do appreciate the the fact that we we do have the ability to catch ourselves though, right? And one, one thing is more on feeling and gut. When I'm making decisions, if I don't feel uncomfortable, then I haven't gone far enough, mm. right? I always need to be pushing myself. And that discomfort should lie in the risk that I'm, I'm taking. Right. And so if I'm not making institutional risk, if there isn't um, some real tension there, then I need to probably go further. Right. Mm -hmm. So that's generally like the, the, the feeling I run in my in my stomach is some level of unsettledness. Right. Mm -hmm. um, number two, um, I think the other thing I try to do is I ask myself a set of questions. So I always ask myself a set of questions when I'm making decisions. Okay, I accept that in every decision there's upside and downside. There's no decision where there's all upside. So I always try to ask myself, okay, where there's upside, who is most likely to to capture the upside? Where there's downside, who is mo most likely likely to have the downside fall on them? How are we mitigating the downside? How are we maximizing the upside? And if the answer to that question is like it's most likely that people who have already experienced downside for generations are the most likely to experience that downside, then that's probably a decision I shouldn't make, right? Mm -hmm. um, so it's always in the interest of building more power for folks who have historically not had that power and also creating the, the ability for them to, to organize more after that decision is made or after the campaign is been done, mm -hmm. right? And so I think there's, these are the types of questions we get into when we're deciding which reform or which measure that isn't complete liberation is acceptable, right? Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and I think there are reforms that to me are unacceptable because they they make it harder for us to organize. And there are reforms that are are acceptable because it makes it easier, easier for us to organize and harder for the opposition to organize. Mm -hmm. And I think when we ask ourselves those questions, we put ourselves in a better position to resist elite capture. Mm -hmm. 
Mm. Femi? Yeah, that really resonated with me, um, especially the, you know, starting point, which is elite capture is systemic. Right? It's what happens when the most advantaged people have more ability to mold the world around their interests and how they see it and how they want things to be. And so the question that I asked myself, um, really jumping off that last point that Maurice made is, are the other people that I'm organizing with, um, or maybe, you know, for in some sense, um, is their ability to act more or less dependent after our campaign, right? So if what we're after is self-determination, people being able to decide the course of their lives, then what you hope for, what you work for, is after our organizing, people are less dependent, not just on the system, but also on, you know, even the people doing the organizing over here, right? Mm -hmm. You know, we were creating organizers, not just people that we instruct to turn up to protest, right? right? We're working with people to create, you know, to make it easier to do self-directed political thought, not acolytes of this or that particular dogma, right? Um, whether it's thinking, whether it's organizing, is are people's capacities expanding or are they contracting? Are people getting more or less dependent? on you or on even the organization and on society i think those are questions we can ask at every point mm. thank you both so much femi and maurice i really really appreciated our time together today um as always learning all the time from both of you guys and so appreciate uh getting to share your work and your thoughts maurice um and your this amazing book femi with our folks out here in seattle and nationally um for our guests online thank you so much for being a part of another margaret casey foundation book club event as always these are free events and available on our youtube page and for information on our past and future events please check us out at caseygrants.org. On behalf of Marguerite Casey Foundation, all, all those who work so hard to make this book club possible, I thank you for joining us and I hope you guys have a great rest of your day.